What happened in season one of The Witcher? What was going on with the timeline? And what were the things that we might have missed? Hi everyone, this is Robert. Welcome to In Deep Geek. This video is brought to you by my wonderful Patreon community. On this channel, I cover what I consider to be the best of science fiction and fantasy, including The Witcher, J.R.R. Tolkien and Lord of the Rings, Westworld, A Song of Ice and Fire, and much more. Please do check out my other videos if you're interested. The key to understanding Season 1 of The Witcher is found in the penultimate line of the last episode of the season. Geralt finally meets Ciri and says that people linked by destiny will always find each other. Geralt and Ciri are linked by destiny, and this, Season 1, is effectively the story of how and why they met. And it's not just those two who are linked. The last line of the season that Ciri says is, Who is Yennefer? Because Yennefer is also linked to the two of them. Geralt tied his fate to hers, we'll get to the details of that in a bit, and because he is linked to Ciri, this makes the three of them a little family of sorts. Season 1 is therefore the origin story for this little triumvirate. But that's the end of this season's story, the coming together of Geralt and Ciri. For the most part, our three main characters aren't together this season. In fact, Although this story is broadly told from their three perspectives, and those three individual stories are broadly each progressing forwards rather than jumping around, what we see happening in any given episode is usually three different stories from three different points in time. So, in episode one, we see Yennefer from a long time ago, Geralt from at least 16 and probably more years ago, and Ciri from just a few days or weeks ago compared to the season end. Which sounds complicated, but it really isn't. Whenever we see Ciri, it is now the time that we see at the end of the season, and whenever we see Geralt or Yennefer until the very end, it is some time in the past. They don't appear to age because of magic and mutations. What we see happen to them spans decades. For them, there are big jumps in time between episodes. Their stories, though often happening years apart, are told side by side, not to confuse us, but to help us see the echoes and similarities between all three of their backstories. For example, in episode 2, Ciri meets Dara, an elf who saves her. We learn of Yennefer's quarter-elf heritage and why that's important, and Geralt encounters the King of the Elves, who gives us a bit of background about the Elves and spares his life. These three events take place decades apart, but are linked, so we are shown them together in the same episode. The other bit of context we need to know before we dig into the detail of Season 1 is that this season is loosely based on the first two books about the Witcher, the two collections of short stories called The Last Wish and Sword of Destiny. I say loosely because although the overall story arc is the same, there are a lot of changes, both in terms of stories being omitted and details being tweaked or invented, particularly when it comes to Yennefer's background and what Ciri gets up to. That's not a criticism, by the way. Overall, this is a pretty good adaptation of the source material, and the writer of the books was involved, but we do need to acknowledge that this is a slightly different world to that of the books. It's also all set well before the time of the video games, if you've played them. So, let's go through the story of Season 1 in its true chronological order, rather than the order in which we're shown it on screen. This will, I think, help explain a lot of what Geralt and Yennefer's actions are as they go along. The earliest point on this timeline is with Yennefer. We see her as an unwanted daughter and farmhand. We're not told exactly when this is, but it's well over three decades and probably quite a bit more. What's important here for the story arc as a whole is that she has clear, raw, magical power, and is recruited by Tissaia after she unintentionally portals into Aratusa. Yennefer's magical power is not just random, she is a quarter-elf, and it is the elves who originally held the magic in this world, before the humans took it and tried to erase that path of history. Magic in this world is about controlling chaos, 
and for Yennefer, it soon turns out personally to also be about controlling her emotions. She is a, a conduit for chaos like the other initiates, but her ability to control it is related to her ability to channel her emotions. When the other pupils are trying to catch lightning in a bottle, and some of them succeeding, Yennefer can't do that, but when she gets angry, she can hurl lightning at someone. She is a raw, magical talent. So, the other initiates who aren't just good at being a conduit are turned into eels and trapped there to help boost the magical stock of Aratusa. but Yennefer and Fringilla, more about her in a moment, are both deemed good enough to be initiated into the Brotherhood of Sorcerers. There is a bit of a subplot here about Istred, Yennefer's lover, giving away her secret that she has elven blood, but the important point is that in order to ascend to being a proper magician, she must lose her ability to have children. This will be a huge factor in her decisions later on in the season. The other thing that happens is, of course, that she gets to decide on what she looks like. She decides to change from a face and body that most people seem not to find attractive to one that most people seem to find very attractive, and somewhere along the line also gains a killer dress sense and a first-rate makeup palette, becoming the Yennefer we know and love. She goes to the ball, entrances the King of Vengerberg, and gets to be the court sorcerer to aid him rather than Nilfgaard which is where the Brotherhood of Sorcerers wanted her to go. At which point, we should probably talk about why this placement is important, what the Council of Wizards actually does, and the geopolitical situation on the continent more broadly, because all this forms the backdrop to pretty much everything that follows. This part of the world of the Witcher is carved into a number of small kingdoms, and the Brotherhood of Sorcerers sends each of them their own court sorcerer, if they will have them. The sorcerer is there to advise and to aid, but should at least retain a loyalty to the Brotherhood. The Brotherhood themselves take a rather paternalistic approach to the continent, trying to remain neutral where possible, but having a clear view on what is best for everyone, and ensuring the Brotherhood's interests are protected at all times. At the time at which Yennefer is being considered as a potential court sorcerer, there are no real overarching military powers, just a whole series of kingdoms squabbling with each other. Yennefer's decision to manipulate her way into going to Adam, where she came from, rather than Nilfgaard to the south, may have seemed quite insignificant at the time, but there were two key implications. First, it meant that Sintra, another city-state, decided to keep up its opposition to having a court sorcerer throughout the whole period where Pavetta was developing her magical powers, so that came as a surprise to everyone. Again, more about that in a moment. And secondly, Yennefer going to Adim meant that the sorcerer Fringilla was sent to Nilfgaard. And Nilfgaard, with Fringilla's support, grew in strength massively over the next thirty years or so, invading one small kingdom after another. Yennefer wasn't there. In fact, she spent those thirty years off-screen, getting more and more bored and frustrated in the backwater of Adam. So, let's leave her there and pick up with Geralt. We don't see his whole origin story, although we're told about it in snippets through the season. I won't go over the whole Witcher mythology now, the signs, the mutations and swords and so on, but let me know in the comments below if you'd like that kind of thing in a future video. Instead, we meet him as a fully-fledged Witcher, travelling the land looking for jobs. The first episode is when he gets his nickname and reputation as the Butcher of Blaviken, which follows him around thereafter. Although it's tempting not to look for any character development in Geralt, he is his same gruff, monotone self throughout, the Geralt we see here is undoubtedly different to the character we have at the end of the season. And he does go on a character arc of sorts. Here he is more of a loner, not wanting anyone's help, and is even a bit idealistic in his own way. The two antagonists in this episode spend their time trying to convince Geralt that he should pursue what they consider to be the lesser evil out of two options in front of him. Geralt doesn't even want to engage in that discussion, because evil is evil, he says, full stop. He wants to be independent, unattached, not taking sides, but here he learns that that is not always possible. He tries not to take the side of the wizard Stregobor, 
and then not to take Renfri's side, but he soon realises that blood will be shed either way, and out of self-defence really kills quite a few people, including Renfri. When he tries to redress the balance by preventing Stregobor from taking Renfri's body for autopsy, the people, encouraged by Stregobor, turn on him. Geralt here learns that being neutral is not always possible, and to compound matters, he gets a reputation as the Butcher of Blaviken, which sticks with him. Not only are witches distrusted generally, but he is now feared personally. For someone whose livelihood depends on commissions from strangers, this is a problem. In short, from then on, Geralt has a PR problem. The stories about him precede him wherever he goes. At which point, enter Yaskia, or Dandelion, if you are used to the books and video games. He enters the story the very next episode, and immediately spots an opportunity that would be beneficial to both of them. If he hangs around with Geralt, he will get a lot of good material for his songs, and Geralt will start getting a bit of positive PR. In the medieval world, and fantasy worlds more broadly, the role of a minstrel is not just that of an entertainer. They are the storytellers, the passers-on of truths and legends. Most people never get to meet kings and wizards and witches, so their opinions of them were formed by the stories and legends of them, and the songs that were sung about them. Songs like Toss a Coin to Your Witcher are really just medieval versions of propaganda. Geralt could have made Yaskia stop following him very easily. Instead, he lets him hang around, shares meals with him, and even lets him lead him to places he wouldn't otherwise go, like Sintra for that feast. Geralt may have been grumpy about it, but he had learned the value of not just operating on his own, but being in a team. At which point, let's turn our attention to Sintra, we mentioned it in passing earlier, noting that it hadn't had a court sorcerer for a long time, so there was no one there to notice the magical stuff going on beneath the surface. And it turns out that there were two rather large magical things going on that nobody had noticed. The first happened years before Geralt was there. Basically, the king got into trouble and was saved by Dunny, the hedgehog man, who, when asked to name his reward, invoked the law of surprise. He asked to be paid what the king already possessed, but did not yet know about. Whatever windfall he returned home to find. As rewards go, this is a bit hit and miss, of course, because the king could have gone home to find an apple left out for him, or a new pair of pantaloons, or whatever. But what he actually returned to find was a new daughter, Pavetta. Now... This doesn't mean that the new princess belonged to Dunny like a slave, but that their fates were bound together, and Dunny does return in secret many years later to woo her and they fall in love. But the important point to note here is that the law of surprise is more than just an old tradition which should be honoured. It's about destiny, one of the most important concepts in this world. A lot of people, including Queen Calanthe and Geralt himself, initially, don't take destiny very seriously. But it is undoubtedly, to borrow a phrase from C.S. Lewis, part of the deep magic of this world. Something that is true and there, regardless of what you might think, and cannot be prevailed against. So, jumping back to Geralt and that feast... It was supposed to be a betrothal feast for Princess Pavetta to seal a political alliance, but Dunny turns up to claim what is his by right and by destiny. Queen Calanthe, not caring about the law of surprise, tries to get Geralt and pretty much everyone else to kill Dunny. When Calanthe herself tries to kill Dunny, Princess Pavetta, who is in love with him, finally cracks and unleashes her raw magical power. Because this is the second magical thing that's been going on all this time in Sintra that no one spotted. Pavetta is an incredibly powerful magic user. The upshot of all this, though, is that Queen Calanthe allows Dunny and Pavetta to marry. Dunny is cured of his hedgehog curse, and Geralt is asked to name his reward for stopping all the bloodshed. He, of course, jokingly invokes the law of surprise, that which Dunny already has but does not know about, and, of course... We then find out that Pavetta is pregnant, so the unborn child 
this child of a union forged in destiny and daughter of an immensely powerful raw magic user, is now tied to Geralt. His four-letter response to this realisation is understandable. But Geralt is Geralt, and he hasn't yet learned to embrace destiny, so he walks away. He won't return to Sintra, and we won't see Ciri, that promised child, until she is grown. We're told she loses her parents tragically at sea, and is raised, apparently relatively happily, by Calanthe, her grandmother. During those years, Geralt pretty much carries on doing his Witcher thing. There are hints that his destiny is tugging at him. He says he isn't sleeping well and is searching for a djinn, which can obviously grant powerful wishes. He finds the bottle, but of course Yaskia intervenes, and in order to try to save him, Geralt finally meets Yennefer, and their two timelines converge. At which point, let's catch ourselves up on why Yennefer has set herself up in a random small town. She was, as we saw, serving as court sorcerer in Adim for 30 years, but that came to a dramatic end when she gets caught up in an assassination attempt on the Queen and her young baby. Yennefer eventually escapes with the baby, but the baby dies in her arms. Holding that baby as it died clearly had an impact on Yennefer. It reminded her of what she gave up to be a sorcerer, and how much, despite everything, she still wants children. She goes off-grid, understandably not returning to the court where the assassination attempt was planned. Instead, she sets up a shop in an obscure town, selling spells to locals and putting them in a trance so that they have an orgy in front of her, it seems. Anyway, it appears that what she's really doing, or trying to do, is find a magical way to get back her ability to have children. Saya, her old mentor, turns up and basically tells her to calm down. She's become obsessed, and as the key to her magical powers is controlling her emotions, this could get quite dangerous for everyone. So, enter Geralt. He wants her to cure Yaskia, which incidentally is more evidence of Geralt's growing character during the season. It was Yaskia's own stupidity that caused the problem, but Geralt is still trying to save him at significant personal cost. Yennefer, of course, spies an opportunity. The djinn surely has enough power to bring back her ability to have children, so she tries to capture it. Geralt sees, as to say us, or that the attempt would destroy her, and he uses his last wish with the djinn to, well, we never find out for certain exactly what he wishes for, either on the show or in the books, but it is something along the lines of tying Yennefer's fate to his. This meant that the djinn couldn't destroy her, as it couldn't destroy its master Geralt, and as all three wishes were then used up, it could escape. Geralt and Yennefer then have sex, but Geralt, never the gentleman and ever on the run from destiny, leaves first thing in the morning. Next up, we have the dragon hunt, some time later, that Geralt and Yennefer both find themselves on. What we have missed in the time jump between the djinn episode and the dragon episode is a long period of time off-screen where Geralt and Yennefer keep meeting, being drawn together and torn apart. Their fates are tied together. The dragon hunt is fun, but the most important thing that happens here is actually right at the end. Borch, the dragon, talks movingly about the importance to him of the baby dragon, his child, that he has been protecting, and the conversation escalates quickly from there. Geralt admits that he used his last wish to bind Yennefer's fate to his. She understandably takes offence at this, questioning whether her feelings for him are true or just the result of magic. Had he basically taken away her free will? He takes offence at that, and accuses her of flitting about like a tornado, wreaking havoc just so she could have a baby, to which she responds that he has a child, that he bound to him, and then abandoned. Borch the dragon interrupts the argument and in ominous tones declares that Yennefer will never regain her womb, and that although Geralt never wants to lose Yennefer, he will. Yennefer leaves, and Borch tells Geralt that his destiny is still out there, meaning Ciri, of course. 
Borch leaves, and Geralt lets out his anger on Yaskia, basically telling him to leave as well. If you're looking for a hinge moment in season one, it's right there. Yennefer discovers her fate is bound to Geralt, but decides to leave him. Geralt is told twice that he should finally face up to his responsibility to Ciri, and finally decides that he will. The man who has spent almost the entire season fighting against destiny is finally going to embrace it. Because we next see Geralt in episode 7, arriving at Sintra to claim Ciri. Pavetta, of course, as was the case when Dunny tried to claim what was his through the law of surprise, is having none of it, trying to fob him off with a looky-likey, and then, when Geralt isn't fooled, throws him into prison. And this is the point at which Geralt's timeline catches up with Ciri's, because Nilfgaard attack. We see it here from Geralt's perspective, and back in episode one from Ciri's perspective. They're happening at the same time. Geralt escapes during the confusion of the attack. Calanthe finally comes to her senses as the castle is about to fall, and realises that the safest place for Ciri right then actually is with Geralt, but it's too late, he's already gone. So Calanthe entrusts Ciri to Mausak, and everything we see in her story over the episodes of season one happens in the few days after the destruction of Sintra. She meets the elves, Nilfgaard clearly wants to capture her and send the doppelganger after her, and so on. The most important point here, though, is what appears to be the awakening of her powers at the end of episode seven. One of her old street friends from Sintra finds her and decides to hand her over to Nilfgaard. There's a reward, after all. And she unleashes her power. They didn't stand a chance. This isn't the first time we've seen Ciri's powers. She screams when her grandmother sends her away, rattling a few glasses, then again later as she's escaping Sintra, creating a chasm in the ground. This time, she hurls her captors away from her, killing them. She blacks out, but is helped from there by Zola, one of the kindliest people in this season, who cares for her in her farmstead until her husband returns. While Ciri is there, she sees the signs of a distant battle raging. This, we find out in a bit, is the Battle of Sodden Hill, which brings us back round to Yennefer. Finally, in this last episode, all of the strands of the story are starting to come together and happen at the same time. We left Yennefer striding away from Geralt, having been told by the dragon that she would never regain her womb, and angry with Geralt that he had bound her fate to his. She heads off to find her first lover, Istred, wondering whether she can rekindle that romance. And we probably can't judge her for that. But no, he doesn't want her now. For years he chased after her and she pushed him away, and now it's the other way around. But while she's there, another sorcerer, Vilgefortz, persuades her to return to Aratusa. She goes, and we're plunged back into the world of paternalistic politics for the continent. Nilfgaard are about to attack Sintra. Should the Brotherhood of Sorcerers intervene? No, they decide. So, as we saw, Sintra had no magical defences against the overwhelming opposition. Well, Mausak was there and did a great job, but he couldn't last forever. Sintra fell, and Nilfgaard were still pushing forward. If the Brotherhood were going to do anything to save the Northern Kingdoms, their best chance was to take a stand at Sodden Hill, an old elven stronghold. And some of the sorcerers do decide to take a stand, including Yennefer, Triss Merigold, who doesn't have a huge role this season but will be important later, Tissaia, and many others. But the odds are not good. As well as having a large army, Nilfgaard has been conscripting mages as they've been going. A huge battle ensues, and Nilfgaard clearly have the upper hand. The critical moment, though, happens when Yennefer and Tissaia find themselves alone on a high point overlooking the battle. They have a moment when Yennefer finally acknowledges that Tissaia saved her from a life of drudgery all those years ago, and Tissaia accepts that Yennefer should follow her instincts and let her natural powers flow. Yennefer takes this advice, channels all of the negative emotions she had bottled up inside her, and unleashes fiery hell on the Nilfgaardians. And 
we don't know what happened next. We get a dream that Ciri seems to intercept of Tissaia and Geralt looking for Yennefer afterwards, but that's it. What we do have is the scene I talked about at the start of this video, which rounds off the season. Geralt and Ciri finally meeting. We've already talked about Ciri's journey to that farmstead. Geralt escaped from Sintra and on his way through the hinterland stumbles across a merchant whose kindly heart has moved him to bury the bodies of dead refugees from the war, trying to give them some dignity. Geralt was on his way back to Caer Morhen and clearly wanted to just ignore what was happening and move on, but by now the idea that he can stay neutral has long passed. When ghouls attack the merchant, Geralt turns back to save him, but is bitten in the process. The merchant carries him back to his farmstead. It is, of course, the same farmstead that Ciri was at. The merchant's wife was the one who took her back there, and now the merchant is bringing him to her. There is one throwaway moment here that reinforces the link between Geralt and Ciri. The merchant says that he can never repay Geralt for saving his life, but he offers him the law of surprise, that which he has but does not know, the new thing awaiting him when he returns home. He gives it to Geralt, whatever it is. And the first thing the merchant's wife, actually let's call her Zola, for that is her name, and her role is just as important as Jürger the merchant's is, the first thing she says is that they have found a girl, Ciri and she is in the woods. Geralt remembers something that Renfri, way back in episode one, told him, that the girl in the woods is his destiny, and he goes to her. The season ends with destiny finally fulfilled. Geralt and Ciri twice bound together by the law of surprise. He, the legendary witcher, she, the magic user of as yet unfathomed depths, finding each other in the woods as prophesied. In the distance, Yennefer's fate is in the balance, but she too is bound to Geralt and Ciri whether she likes it or not, and we'll see where that leads in Season 2. Let me know in the comments below if you'd like more Witcher videos, either explaining the concepts or doing some character studies. If you'd like to see some Lord of the Rings and J.R.R. Tolkien videos building up to the huge budget Amazon TV series, please click on the playlist on the left of your screen. Or if you'd like to support this channel, or get access to some content I produce just for my patrons, please click on the link to my Patreon page on the right of the screen. Thanks for watching, that's all for this time, and I'll see you again soon.